Antarctica is the last continent to be colonized by humans. With a total winter population of only about a thousand people, it remains one of the most inhospitable and remote places on Earth to live. It is very hard to describe Antarctica. I think of it as a, a place of extremes. I mean, it's an extreme environment and it, it's an extreme condition for a group of humans to be down on what should be an uninhabitable continent. How does Australia select and prepare the expeditioners that spend the long dark winter at our Antarctic stations? To find out, we're following the team of people in training to overwinter at Davis Station this year, two of them in particular. Jan Wallace is the lone station doctor responsible for keeping her small, isolated community alive and well for 14 months. I think me getting injured is one of my big worries. You think, who's going to look after me? So... Cliff. Um, Cliff, <laughs> yes. <laughs> As one of the tradies, steel fabricator Cliff Simpson-Davis will help keep the station operating and support the scientific research. I'm a city boy. People who know me can't believe I go down there and want to do all this. And like, it's great, I love it. <laughs> Each year, over 2,000 applications for jobs in Antarctica are whittled down to 200 suitable people. Of these, only 75 are chosen for the winter expedition. The variety of people and the diversity of people on station makes it um, a fascinating place to work. And we're looking for people who who have the ability to adapt to those conditions. This is your doctor's issue for the winter. And Cliff, this is your tradies issue for the winter. Thank you. We don't really have a stereotype of the person we're looking for. What we look for is a number of personal qualities, I suppose, that we make sure people have, we make sure that they have the capacity to not be of a negative influence on a station community, their capacity to deal with the isolation, uh, the separation and in a small community and their capacity to deal with change and, and diversity in that small team. Is it? Where is it? <laughs> Put on that. Now we're ready for the great outdoors. <laughs> After more than a century, Australia's presence in Antarctica is still largely dependent on long voyages in ships. hundred years ago, Mawson uh, went down south and still we leave Hobart and go down south, penetrate the Southern Ocean and, and the sea ice and uh, leave people uh, in Antarctica at Casey Davis or Mawson. Once you're there for winter, you can't change your mind and come back. You wait for the next ship to return. It's eight to nine months of, of real isolation where we have got in uh, most of our stations no ability currently to respond in a timely manner to a uh, medical emergency or a surgical emergency. What do doctors in Antarctica have to expect? Expect the unexpected, I think. Everything's got the A factor down there, so simple things become very difficult. The old expedition logbooks are full of first-hand accounts of life on the edge. In 1961, a mechanic at Mawson Station suffered a severe brain hemorrhage. Now, the station just didn't have the surgical instruments needed to save his life, so they made their own. The doctor, with the help of the geologist and the cook, operated twice before the patient was airlifted out to make a full recovery. I select all the doctors going to Antarctica and, and I'm looking for a generalist who can cope with whatever uh, walks through the door. Like the case of Leonard Rogozov in 1961, the station doctor at a remote Russian base. When he developed severe appendicitis, he saved his own life by operating on himself. He instructed his friends what to do if he passed out, successfully removed the offending organ and he became a hero of the Soviet Union. By then, Australia already had its own policy to avoid this sort of risk. When Mawson Station was established in 1954, each member of this first wintering party carried the same scar. By government decree, 
they all had their appendix removed before they went south. It's a policy that remains for Australian doctors in Antarctica, like Jan. Giving up her appendix is the price she pays, but not everyone else. Surprisingly, appendicitis is actually quite common in Antarctica compared to the general community. Oh, it hurts. The pain. That's why today is Surgical Training Day, where tradies with no previous experience in an operating theatre are trained to assist her in removing an appendix. The patient is called Manuel. Have you ever done anything like this before? It's way, way out in the left field. I'm normally on the table getting operated on. The Royal Hobart Hospital has been training Antarctic expeditioners for nearly 30 years. The doctor's on their own, so they need help. That's the best way we can do it. There's no nurses down there. And because it's so far away and it can take a long time to be able to evacuate people back to a tertiary facility, they need to have, have a few people trained. This is the only training program of its kind in Australia, perhaps the world. Each year, four of the expeditioners are trained to assist the doctor in theatre. So if we do have to have a surgical case, I've only got one set of hands and to perform an operation, you need quite a few people. Some scissors, Which might be better. Yep, they'll be nice and nice and fine. Okay. okay. While the trainees don't wield a scalpel, they're taught how to maintain a sterile zone, handle the instruments, monitor the patient's vital signs and administer anaesthetic. Hand that off to Cliffy. We don't want to No, you get to do that. Yeah. Right, so I'll stop you there. What haven't you done? Put gloves on. Can't help anyone who gets sick. <laughs> they better not, because I'm going to sort them out. <laughs> That's a good incentive for people not to get sick. I might be their scrub nurse. The doctor also does all the dental work, so dentistry is actually probably about a quarter of our work. What kind of dentist are you, do you think? Oh, I think as a dentist, I'm a very good doctor. <laughs> Medical talents aside, every member of the team selected to overwinter at Davis has to learn new skills as well. Today, it's manoeuvring small boats. Inflatables like this are the basic runabout in coastal Antarctica, so it's a good idea to get as much practice on them before you go. Here in Tasmania, the beaches are the penguin colonies, the jetties are the icebreakers, and giant sea cliffs like this are as close as you get to an iceberg. If I rev, I'm alongside something hard, we've got a problem. As part of the uh, Davis boating team, you'll be possibly responsible on voyage three uh, when the Aurora comes back in to go out and pick up some uh, expeditioners. So you'll be bringing it round to the side of the Aurora Australis. You want to get it in place so you can hold it there. At the helm is James Maloney. He'll be the station leader over winter, responsible for managing the station and resolving any conflicts that may arise. It's a bigger group than normal for Davis. We've got 24 expeditioners coming down, so that's substantially larger than normal years. But having said that, um, no, I certainly don't have any red flags at this point. Uh, everybody seems to be getting along very well. We put people through a 24-hour assessment centre process that runs them through a series of activities uh, in small groups, large groups, individually, to get an idea of their personal qualities and primarily their awareness of their effect on others, so almost an emotional intelligence around knowing if their personality has an effect on other people. This psychosocial assessment sounds a bit like the Big Brother house. It was, yeah, it was, and it was, it was uh, an interesting experience to have um, sort of four or five people who uh, were watching us uh, the entire time with, with clipboards. It's, it's quite an intensive period, and obviously they're looking at our capacity to fulfil the tasks that they're, they're giving us. Hi, Chief, the station leader. Now it's most visible from the outside. We'll give you a report back shortly. Knowing that you can rely on your colleagues to stay calm and competent under pressure is crucial in an emergency. Copy that. Standing by to deploy the fire hack uh, on your advice. Fire destroying part of the station in the middle of an Antarctic winter could be a matter of life or death. If it's an extremely important building, such as a sleeping in medical quarters, and a very, very uncomfortable winter in temporary accommodation with no kitchen, um, freeze-dried rations, so it's no, no fun at all. 
the Davis team is being tested on some realistic scenarios at Tasmania's fire training centre. Firefighting in remote areas is a challenge anywhere, but in the particular conditions of Antarctica, the driest, coldest, windiest continent on the planet, trying to put a fire out can be more difficult than you might expect. During the winter, it is impossible to use normal firefighting techniques that due to the temperature, once we get to around the minus 14, we can't use normal firefighting hose due to the uh, freezing of the water inside of that. We simply can't keep it moving fast enough. And when the hoses aren't frozen, the type of buildings in Antarctica means that firefighters need breathing apparatus. All buildings are extremely well sealed, getting smoke and heat out. It's not like opening the windows like we can in normal households to remove all of those toxic products. There yeah, we're limited to doorways, the windows are small, double glazed, so it's uh, extremely difficult uh, conditions for the crew. Dave, can you hear me, Dave? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, really okay. There's no point dialing triple O. The team has to be totally self-reliant. We have one man down, unconscious. He's not breathing, not breathing. In fact, the perils of life in an Antarctic winter is so similar to a long space journey that it's studied by NASA. There's a lot of parallels. You know, if you mess up outside, there's a good chance you could go belly up if you don't do it right. It's a very small community um, and it's very confined and it's a prolonged uh, isolation. Uh, without any access to external support. So it's about the closest thing you've got to a, a nine-month mission to Mars. In the next few decades, groups of select astronauts will take that long journey into space. When they do, it will be with knowledge gained from Antarctica about how small teams of people coped with cramped conditions and extreme risk for long periods of time. Life in a bubble can lead to mood, personality or sleep disorders. Research reveals around 5% of people overwintering in Antarctica develop the diagnostic criteria of at least one psychiatric disorder. So the Expedition 31 crew getting their first look inside this uh, brand new spacecraft. There's also evidence that the stress of isolated and confined environments actually suppresses the immune system which can allow latent viruses to reactivate and spread. Such risks have emerged in both Antarctic communities and the International Space Station. It's important that we understand what are the physiological changes, what are the uh, psychological changes. A lot of our people self-select to go down south. Yeah, you don't put your hand up to do something in an extreme environment without having a lot of considered uh, um, thought before. Surprisingly, though, many expeditioners want to return for more tours of duty. The figures are around 40% each year of people who have been south before. We've got an expeditioner this season who's due to go back to Macquarie Island um, for his 11th winter. So we, 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 we do get returning people. They often get the bug and, and want to come back again. OK, don't be shy. Cliff is going back for his third winter. And Jan's been the wintering doctor at Davis once before. It's a very different tone and feel when that last ship departs and the very small winter crews left behind. Um, it's kind of calm and a little bit apprehensive. You think, oh, how are we going to go? What's ahead of us this year? We don't really know. Um, and it is a journey with a its right ups and downs. Yeah. So if they need tradies on Mars, you reckon you're up for it? Uh, small steps. Maybe the moon, but... <laughs> if they kept it down 18 months there and back, I could possibly hit it. I know I can do 18 months <laughs> in confinement. After selection for their technical skills, psychological profile and medical fitness, these are the people deemed to have the right stuff. The big days arrive for the 60 or so expeditioners who'll be spending the next 12 to 18 months in Antarctica over winter. It's a bit like they're boarding their own space shuttle to travel to another planet. 
Bon voyage. Welcome aboard for Voyage One. Uh, we're heading off uh, to Davis Station, as you all know, and uh, should be a great trip. A um, bit of ice to uh, to get through to start with. Uh, let's hope we make it. That's the, the the main objective is to get there. The trip from Hobart to Eastern Antarctica will take at least two weeks, ice permitting. It's been a long time for the expeditioners to be off their tools. Uh, six or seven weeks of quite intensive training. So I think it'll be great when they can get down there and, and, and set to task um, and, and also enjoy the environment because it is a very special place. Uh,